We're always developing as thinkers, and if there's one thing I can say about my own thinking, it's that it has changed a lot over the years. In this video, I want to share some of the books that have helped form my thinking, and in the process, chart something of my own intellectual journey. We very seldom come with a fully formed set of ideas, and it takes time and effort to think things through. There are still an awful lot of things that I haven't thought through, and there are hazy areas or moments of tension in my beliefs. So, for example, most of you will know by now that I'm a pretty strong pro-free market capitalist, but also that I'm not a full ANCAP or libertarian. That means where exactly the state needs to be strong and in which areas it needs to operate is something I've still not fully worked out. It's, you know, it's a work in progress. Anyway, here in this video, I want to feature 15 books that have been key in forming my thought to date. I'm going to start with the only book in this list that isn't non-fiction, and that's George Orwell's 1984, which I hope I don't need to explain uh, to anyone watching this video. When I was a teenager, I was a very big fan of David Bowie, obsessive in fact, and he had an album that came out in 1974 called Diamond Dogs, which was very loosely based on 1984. Well, anyway, after reading about this book time and time again, I had to get my hands on the novel itself. And I can't remember exactly how old I was, maybe 16, 15, something like that. But I do remember that I read the whole thing in one sitting. And when I was finished, I immediately turned back to page one and read the whole thing again. It was one of those times where uh, I read it and then I walked around as if I was in a daze for the next day or so. It definitely had a profound impact uh, on the way I thought about things. And although I don't really think uh, about it much these days, it does perhaps lie at the heart of why I've always been so against totalitarian systems and why freedom is so important to me. It's a really foundational book, I guess, in uh, who I am as a thinker. It also opened the door to so many other dystopian texts, Clockwork Orange, Brazil, Brave New World, uh, many others. It was also the likely impetus behind me reading Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, which, when you're a teenager with a head full of dystopian fiction, seems like it makes a lot of sense. Then, when I got to university, I encountered Louis Althusser's essay, Ideology and the Ideological State Apparatus, which is reprinted in his book Lenin and Philosophy. Althusser was a Marxist who wanted to explain why the Communist Revolution didn't happen in the West, as Marx had predicted. His answer was akin to Neo finding out he's in the Matrix. Everything you think, everything you've ever thought, is ideology produced by institutions, including your family, your school, everybody you've ever known, uh, is it what he calls interpolating you into ideology in order to reproduce capitalism at the level of the individual subject. Again, when you're 18, Althusser seems like he has tremendous explanatory power. A lot of what he says about the process of ideological interpolation makes sense. Ideology isn't some conscious thing, it's insidious, it works on the level of common sense. According to Althusser, capitalism works at the level of your very deepest assumptions, assumptions that you'd never even think to question. However, the problem with Althusser is that he seemed to assume the perfect functioning of the state and of ideology, and he sees very little scope to ever challenging ideology. There is no outside of ideology. There's virtually no scope for individual autonomy or agency. You're just kind of stuck in it. Even if he got his own way, all that would happen is that communist ideology would come to replace capitalist ideology. The individual person is no more or less bound by ideology. In Althusser's view, Marxist knowledge is scientific, which means in a nutshell that you can see through all of the BS to the underlying material reality of things underneath. But somehow he seems to think that this level of insight is beyond human beings, a bit like uh, the shadows in Plato's cave and the ideal forms. Anyway, for several years I was haunted by Althusser. I felt like everything he said was true at some level, 
but that the lack of freedom he afforded to people was too constricting, too pessimistic, and seemed to miss something fundamental about the human experience. If Althusser was right, how does any sort of change ever come about? And that sent me off looking for freedom. First, it was in the framework of Marxist or postmodern thinking. Michel Foucault, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, Antonio Negri, Antonio Gramsci, Raymond Williams, Leclerc and Muff, uh, you name them, I, I, I read through them all. And I kept looking and looking for some scope for individual freedom in these modes of thinking until I eventually figured out that the whole theoretical framework is a dead end. If you want freedom, you're not going to find it in these thinkers. And I had an inkling that all of them were missing something fundamental about human nature. And that, uh, I guess, intuition that I had set me off on a different path. One important book down this path was Isaiah Berlin's Two Concepts of Liberty. I was 21 by this point, and getting out of the straitjacket of Marxist theory was truly liberating. I mean, just the way these guys write is so much clearer than the sorts of stuff you get from those French Marxists. It, seriously, it's it's uh, it's like breathing fresh air for the first time. And uh, Berlin's fundamental contrast between positive liberty, which is uh, the freedom to political action, and negative liberty, which is the freedom from uh, restraint or coercion, remains absolutely at the bedrock of my political thinking. Berlin saw positive liberty as being inevitably dangerous and violent. And here, his dim view of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the radical conception of freedom comes through very strongly. It is something that I inherited wholesale, not only because it plays to my naturally moderate inclinations, but also because the blood and tyranny of revolutions throughout history prove Berlin right again and again. Now around this time I was also starting to try to think outside the continental tradition. Uh, so I picked up Bertrand Russell's History of Western Philosophy, which, while a very opinionated account of the history of ideas from Socrates on down, I felt gave me a very solid philosophical grounding for all further explorations. If you're looking for primers on philosophy, Russell is a very good starting place, but I wouldn't rely on him alone. So I'd also point to um, F.C. Copleston, uh, who's often a good counterweight to Russell. I also quite like Nigel Warburton's Philosophy the Classics, and his podcasts are very useful. One book I found myself coming back to again and again was Machiavelli's The Prince. Here was a book that seemingly everyone admired. Louis Althusser had written a book called Machiavelli and Us. Antonio Gramsci had a big section of his prison notebooks called The Modern Prince. Isaiah Berlin had a great essay called The Originality of Machiavelli. Bertrand Russell seemed to think he was the only important thinker of the Renaissance. But most of all, Machiavelli is just fun. He's kind of like... I don't know, a Quentin Tarantino in political philosophy form. And if you grew up, as I did, loving gangster flicks and pretending to be Al Pacino, then here was the thinker who made that world make sense. He's just so practical, so rooted in the real world, and his cynicism about human motives is deeply troubling. The basic ideas at the bedrock of Machiavelli are, just as Berlin's negative liberty ideas I've never quite been able to shake off or seen any convincing counter evidence to suggest otherwise. In Machiavelli's world, human appetites are seemingly unlimited and if someone has scope to screw you over and benefit, they likely will screw you over and benefit. Is Machiavelli right? Do nice guys always finish last? Well, it's something I've grappled with for years, but surely he's right that someone who combines the qualities of both the fox and the lion will stand a better chance against either one of them.
One line of thinking that Machiavelli got me down was the art of statecraft and geopolitics. For example, I remember seeing many parallels between The Prince and Robert Kagan's book, Paradise and Power, which was something like the neocon manifesto before the invasion of Iraq. More recently, I also read, and I think this qualifies as a key title, Henry Kissinger's world order, which, regardless of what you make of its author, does a great job of explaining the geopolitical history and thinking in key regions around the world. And he's especially strong, as you'd imagine, on US foreign policy and history. Uh, So in foreign policy, I'm what you might call a, a realist. It's the area where I think Machiavelli continues to hold most true. But Machiavelli also got me down another line of thinking. If he was right that there's something basic to our nature that makes us behave in this self-interested way, then what is it? And does that mean that all the Marxists and continental thinkers that I read at university were wrong about the primacy of ideology and culture in making us who we are? This led to me reading Stephen Pinker's The Blank Slate. I must have been in my mid-twenties by this point, and it was honestly quite thrilling to kill the last remnants of my university indoctrination by reading this book. It was like a full detoxification of Marxism and postmodernism. I'm not sure if I've read a single book that has transformed my thinking so utterly by the time I finished it. Now, A lot of the picture I'd been building up in my ongoing struggles with Marxist theory began to fall into place by reading Pinker. The blank slate just isn't true, and human nature, despite what a hundred postmodern quacks say, is a real thing. And this got me into evolutionary psychology more broadly, which I'll come back to in a moment. Another book that I read around this time was uh, Freakonomics by Stephen Levitt and Stephen Dubner, which is a book that approaches a lot of social and political issues through the lens of economics and especially data analysis. Something about that empirical approach really appealed to me. I love the study in there, for example, uh, where they compare hourly real pay of drugs dealers and gangsters to people who work in McDonald's. And they actually find that most of the time you're probably better off working McDonald's than joining a gang. I also love the study of crime statistics in New York and the way they analyse each of the explanations for why the crime rate dropped. And that's the study where they get to uh, abortion as the actual root cause. It was this book... Uh, free economics that single-handedly got me more interested in economics as a subject. I read the follow-up, Super Free Economics, and I started following Levitt and Dubner's blog, uh, listening to their podcast. One reason that this stuff appealed to me was the way, just like in Machiavelli, I suppose, that the analysis was always rooted in the real world, concrete examples Uh, and situation. There's a clear link between empirical reality and their conclusions that is often missing in the a priori thinking of the postmodernists. Finally, the third book I read in my mid-twenties was Jared Diamond's Guns, Gyms and Steel, which would set uh, off an on-and-off-again side interest in theories of history and macro explanations for the development of civilizations. Much like Althusser's theory of ideology, Jared Diamond's geographical explanation for the development of history uh, has a huge amount of explanatory power despite some flaws. And that explanatory power intuitively just feels right on some level. There's some truth to it. And, I should say, it especially makes sense to someone who grew up playing Sid Meier's Civilization. You know, if you know the importance of a solid starting location with access to key resources, you're halfway there. At some level, it's just common sense. But when I started reading reactions and negative criticisms of Diamond, I really wanted to read more about it. I wanted to I guess, have an informed view myself on where I stood on this issue. How much do I think the diamond is right or not? Which got me on to David Land's uh, Wealth and Poverty of Nations, which in turn sent me back to Max Weber's The Protestant Work Ethic. Uh, and both of those books emphasise cultural rather than geographical factors in history. It also got me on to books like Ian Morris's Why the West Mul- uh, Rules for Now and Francis Fukuyama's The Origins of Political Order, as well as several 
other books that I've referenced in other videos, including one that I class as key. Uh, and in fact, of all the books uh, on this list, this is the one I finished reading uh, the most recently. And it's Why Nations Fail by uh, Darren Asamoglu and James Robertson, which somewhat explains my undying hatred for socialism, but it also explains why strong political institutions, as well as free economic ones, are necessary for wealth and prosperity. It is the single biggest counter-argument for anyone that would tell you that Africa today is poor because of the West. And I'd strongly recommend, regardless of where you are on the political spectrum, reading Why Nations Fail. It's, there's so much insight in that book. A little later on, when I hit my late 20s, I read another earth-shattering book, which honestly transformed my view of practically everyone and everything. That book was Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, which explains, among other things, how the human mind works in practice and how the vast majority of all our thinking is fast, automatic, intuitive and gut instinctual, as opposed to slow, rational, calculated and strategic. Kahneman lists dozens of heuristics, uh, that is, mental shortcuts that we habitually use to avoid doing the slow thinking. And these include things like confirmation bias, the sunk cost fallacy, priming, anchoring. Once you understand these basic concepts, it's virtually impossible to unsee them. It's like uh, somebody shows you the magic trick of life and you just keep on seeing how the trick is done over and over again. Sometimes I wonder if Kahneman has actually just ruined the world for me. But actually, I think he's helped me see it a lot more clearly. And um, again, I... The word I'd use is liberating. You know, you read Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, and so much more of the world suddenly makes sense. Kahneman also led me to another foundationally important book, which is Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind, who takes Kahneman's basic insight about fast and slow thinking and applies it to morality, uh, mor moral decision-making or ethical decision-making. If you go back to an old video of mine called Arguments from the Left, Part 13, I provide an overview. Or, if you prefer uh, a much flashier version with a cool Californian accent involved, you can head over to my buddy Friended's channel uh, for basically a better video uh, explaining uh, height. And I, I will link uh, both my video and Friended's um, in the show notes. Height's basic idea that the political left leans on only two or three moral foundations, while the right leads on all six moral foundations, had a genuinely profound and long-lasting impact on my thinking, not only on how I view politics, but also on where I would position myself. I was always a moderate centrist, but now uh, Height had explained why I probably felt more vague irritation by, I don't know, a column in The Guardian or by your average social justice warrior, and this was back before I'd ever come across the term SJW, that, than I did from headlines from right-wing trash tabloids like The Sun or The Daily Mail moaning about benefit cheats or whatever. It's an insight that once you understand it, you can never unsee. And to this day, which is, I'd say, about four or five years later now, there's seldom a moment where the insights of Kahneman or Height don't factor in to how I see things. And um, that also led me to another book. Uh, this is a book that kept on getting referenced by Pinker and by uh, Height in various different columns. I think also there's a reference in The Righteous Mind and in The, Bank and the Blank Slate. And that is Thomas Sowell's A Conflict of Visions. Uh, so eventually I... I decided to pick up uh, Conflict of Visions and finally read it. And it does a phenomenal job of fleshing out exactly how the, the left and the right differ on so many issues across morality, justice, politics, economics, the use of language, and so on. And if you haven't read that one, I would strongly recommend picking up because it, it will help you decide where you stand on all of these different 
issues yourself. Um, I made a previous video on this, uh, summarizing the core tenets on the book, which I will link in the notes. Or, if you want a much snazzier and basically better version, I came across this guy called Economics Decoded, who made a great one, which I will also uh, link in the notes. Sowell's underlying thesis about the two visions, I think, arrives at a place eerily similar to Hyde's righteous mind. But what Sowell did was convince me absolutely that I hold the constrained rather than the unconstrained vision. And this led me to pick up several other books by him. He's like a pack of Pringles in a way. Once you pop, you just can't stop. I mean, once you start getting into Sowell, he, he's almost like a kind of subgenre on his own. You just want to keep on reading him. But the most important of the other books by Sowell was undoubtedly The Vision of the Anointed, a much more angry, polemical and partisan study than A Conflict of Visions, which is the closest thing I've come across to getting completely red-pilled. A Sowell just mows down leftist and liberal policy positions, contrasting naive and idealistic promises with disastrous results again and again and again. If you haven't read it, it's well worth the time and the effort. And I would especially read it if you are... Um, if you are a leftist, if you're someone who identifies, I don't know, with uh, the Labour Party here in the UK or, or the Democrats uh, over in America, uh, or if you see yourself as being a, uh, a quote-unquote liberal, I would definitely take the time to read The Vision of the United to question exactly, like, do you hold those same things that Saul is talking about? And if you do, then how do you counter the things that, that he's coming up with uh, in that book? Finally, uh, I wanted to mention Walter Block's Defending the Undefendable, which is a libertarian book that I think brings, uh, or certainly brought me, up against the very limits of my own thinking. Block goes through different sections of society and provides defences for all manner of unsavoury characters who are typically disdained by the rest of society. I mean, it's quite funny. He takes like pimps and prostitutes and smugglers and drug dealers and all sorts of like people that you'd never even think of trying to defend. And then he provides a defense for them um, on free market grounds most of the time. Sometimes he's convincing. At the times, it seems like he's reaching. But I think it's a really, really interesting intellectual exercise that, if nothing else, helps you define where you stand on each of these things. Um, like, he almost demands reasons for thinking the way you do. And if your reason is nothing more than, like, a gut instinct, oh, that's just wrong... Um, then it kind of encourages you to generate a reason for uh, for the position that you hold. He also won me round on a few things. For example, drug legalization, including hard drugs like heroin. I'd never have thought that I'd be for the legalization of Class A drugs, but broadly speaking, I am after reading Walter Block. So it's a very useful book for, I guess, the specifics of where you stand on different things. So there it is. 15 books that changed my thinking and what I'd love in the comments uh, if you've read some of these books and want to share your thoughts I would love to see that but also if you have had books that really changed your thinking that had that kind of like eureka moment or it felt transformative in the way that I've described some of these books um, let me know what they are I'd, I'd love to know I'm always on the on the lookout to expand my own horizons as hopefully are you until next time.